headphones are becoming enormously popular, especially with young people. And uh, there is a danger there because if you put, as I said, more than 80 decibels into your ears for a long period of time, you really damage your hearing. And the damage is much quicker the higher you go. Now, sadly, a lot of kids are putting 100 decibels into their ears, really loud music with earbuds which go deep into the ears and they are killing their hearing. One in six American teenagers has got damaged hearing now as a result of headphone abuse. So we're raising potentially an entire deaf generation. Hey guys, today our guest is Julian Treasure. Julian is an internationally recognized speaker and is a sound and communication expert. Julian is a five-time TED speaker and author of the books How to Be Heard and Sound Business. His five TED Talks about sound and communication have been watched over 90 million times and his talk How to Speak So That People Want to Listen is the sixth most watched TED Talk of all time. Julian also works with major brands worldwide to improve the way they sound and create a lovely sound environment. I am privileged to welcome Julian Treasure to the show. Thank you, Julian, for coming to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Before we go into the questions, uh, can you share where can people connect with you and know about your courses and books? Sure. Well, the website is my name. It's juliantreasure.com. And uh, anybody who goes there can just pop their email address in and they'll get a series of five free videos from me to help with their listening skills. So that's worth doing. Thank you, Julian. My first question is, how does the sound affect us? Sound affects us in four very powerful ways, although most of us are not conscious of this. Uh, we've gone a, a bit numb to sound. You know, once upon a time, sound was the main way we related to the world around us. It's our primary warning sense. You know, you can hear behind you. You can't see behind you. So your hearing goes very deep, very fast to the oldest part of your brain. You react much more quickly to audio threats than you do to visual threats. Nevertheless, the world has got noisier and noisier. We're distracted. Most of the communication protocols that we've invented are visual, and therefore we don't listen so well. So we're not conscious of these four ways that sound affects us. And they are, <clears throat> first of all, physiological. So, you know, if I drop you in a nightclub, you remember those? We used to go to, <laughs> some of us used to go to those, not me anymore. Um, but if you're in a nightclub with pounding dance music, at 140 beats per minute and at high volume, your heart rate will immediately increase. That's called entrainment. And we're being entrained by rhythms outside us all the time. Heart rate, breathing, hormone secretions, even brain waves get entrained by external rhythms and sounds. At the very simplest, if there's a sudden noise, you'll have a shot of cortisol, your fight flight hormone, to make you ready to do something about it. So sound is affecting us <clears throat> physiologically all the time. Second way, psychologically. Uh, you know that with music. Uh, music changes our feelings. Lots of sounds actually affect our feelings. It might be a recording of your grandmother or uh, some sound from your childhood. We, we work a lot by association with sound. So there'll be sounds which will have emotional resonance for you that wouldn't affect me at all and vice versa. Sound changes our feelings. Birdsong, for example, makes most people feel secure because we've learned over hundreds of thousands of years that when the birds are happily singing, normally we're OK. Things are safe. It's also a very good sound to work to because it's nature's alarm clock. When birds start singing, it's time to be awake and therefore it puts you in a pretty good state for working, which is mentally alert and physically relaxed. The third way sound affects us is cognitive. And we, again, everybody will be able to relate to this. If you're trying to think or work or write or do numbers, what's called solo working, it's incredibly difficult if you can hear somebody talking behind you. That's because we have bandwidth for just 1.6 human conversations. And you need to listen to the voice in your head when you're doing solo working. Anybody who's watching this, it's the voice that just said, what voice is he talking about? 
that little voice in your head. When you're writing or doing solo work, you're in an internal dialogue. If you can hear somebody behind you, they're taking up one of your 1.6. And we all know how frustrating it is to try and think in that situation. You know, you'll turn around and say, can you stop talking? I'm trying to do this. That's what happens in open plan offices. And the research shows that our productivity in open plan offices can therefore be reduced by as much as two thirds. It's a serious problem, which perhaps we come back to later. Um, and, the, and then the final way that sound affects us is behaviorally. It changes what we do. So we'll move away from unpleasant sound if we can, probably unconscious. So uh, my company, the sound agency, has been working for years with retailers on exactly this problem. It would obviously be stupid to have a terrible smell in a shop. People would leave. And yet there are thousands of shops that have got terrible sound. And because we've gone numb to the sense of hearing, really, people don't notice. And the effect is the same. People leave or they stay for a shorter time. And retailers call that dwell time. And it's directly related to how much we buy. The longer we stay in a shop, the more likely we are to buy things. So you would think it would be common sense for shops and shopping malls to create a lovely sonic ambience that makes us feel good and stay there longer. Nope. Typically, the sound in there is cacophony because we design spaces with all hard surfaces. The sound bounces around. There's probably a cheap sound system playing fast paced uh, pop music or something um, or fast paced dance music. Uh, fast paced things make us move faster. As I said, we get entrained. Uh, so we go around the shop faster and we leave faster. And the reduction in sales can be as much as a third, according to the research. So those are four ways that sound profoundly affects us all. Physiologically, our bodies. Psychologically, our feelings. Cognitively, our thinking. And also our behavior. Very important to become conscious of this, because by listening to this and being conscious, we can actually turn sound to our advantage. Thank you very much, Julian. Julian, can you differentiate between hearing and listening? Yes, there's a very important distinction here. Hearing is an automatic reflex. It's on all the time, actually. You're hearing even while you're asleep. Uh, if there's a strange noise in your house while you're sleeping, you'll wake up because your ears are working all the time. It's a miraculous sense, actually, the sense of hearing. There is a tiny membrane in your ear, about the size of your little fingernail, tiny. And that is vibrating thousands of times a second and decoding all of the sound around you. It could be anything from a scooter going past or somebody shouting or a dog barking to the most beautiful raga you could ever imagine. Anything and everything is decoded by this tiny little membrane. And that is extraordinary to me. It pushes fluid on the other side, which moves tiny little hairs, each of which is sensitive to a different frequency. And then those hairs cause electrical impulses to fire off in your brain. And we decode all of that as what you're listening to now. Amazing. Well, that's always on. Listening, on the other hand, is not. Listening is very different. It's a mental process. I define listening as making meaning from sound. So we do two things when we're listening. First of all, we select certain things to pay attention to. You hear everything, as I said, in a sphere around you all the time, but you're not listening to it all, all the time. You select certain things to listen to. Secondly, you interpret those things. You make them mean something. Your brain is always testing have I heard that before? Is it like something? What does it mean? Is it a threat? Is it you know, a possibility? Is it something I know? Is it new? Is it like something I know? All of these questions going on all the time. So you're looking for associations. Uh, the sound that will trigger you probably most will be your name. We all become very familiar with that one from a very young age. So if I'm in a cocktail event or a big room with lots of people talking and somebody behind me says, Julian, I'll turn around. I'm uh, attuned to that. Um, then with that kind of meaning making 
comes the understanding, which is very important about listening, that every single person has a listening that is unique. Your listening is different from my listening because you're selecting different things to listen to and you're making them mean different things. Why? Because we listen through a set of filters and those filters are really important to understand. So they include, for example, the culture that we're born into. Yours very different from mine. The language we speak and the way we interpret. Then along the way, as we grow up, we accrete values, attitudes, beliefs from our teachers, from our parents, from role models, from friends, from anybody we choose to. Uh, you will pick some up and cast some aside. I'll do the same thing, but they won't be the same ones. So we end up with a different set of filters there. And then in the moment, we might have expectations of this conversation or intentions. We might have emotions going on. You're listening in a very different way if you've just had great news from if you've just had terrible news. So your feelings affect your listening. In fact, I think there's a, an inverse relationship between listening and upset. Uh, it tends to be that if somebody's very upset, the more you listen to them, the less upset they will become. And also, if we're very upset, it's hard to listen. So there's this inverse relationship. Uh, so listening is um, unique. And one of the most common mistakes that people make with listening, I see this all over the world all the time, is to assume everybody listens like I do. They don't. And out of that realization comes a really transformative way to understand how you speak and to speak more powerfully, which is uh, at the core of my book and my course. That realization is that you always speak into a listening. So right now I'm speaking into your listening and also into the listening of thousands of people who may be seeing this. And all of those listenings are different. Now, doing it like this, I can't really be sensitive that I can see you, I can't see the others. So I'm trying to empathize and intuit what that listening may be. Whether you're in a one-to-one -one conversation or standing on a stage speaking to hundreds or thousands of people, you can ask yourself the question, what's the listening I'm speaking into? What's the listening I'm speaking into? And simply by asking that question over and over again, getting in the habit of being sensitive to it, you will become attuned to the listening. And that means you're far more likely to hit the bullseye. And if you don't ask that question, it's very easy to miss the target altogether by speaking into completely the wrong listening. Um, so, I mean, for example, a tip when you're speaking to somebody uh, would be always to make a little contract with them to say, do you have five minutes? I'd really like you to listen to me for five minutes. If you then say, yes, we have a deal and I have your listening. You're giving me that gift for five minutes. How often do we just bomb up and say to somebody, listen, I need to talk to you. And they're doing something else or thinking about something else or they've just had bad news or good news or, you know, they're going to make a phone call in two minutes or whatever it might be. The listening is never the same. It changes through the day and it changes from person to person. Thank you, Julian. Julian, you say that uh, we have an epidemic of not listening. What do you mean by that? Well, sadly, I think a lot of that's to do with technology and noise. Those two things are very important in this. The world is getting noisier year by year. I'm not sure which city you're in, but I know that Mumbai, for example, is one of the noisiest cities on the planet. Um, I, I've been to India several times and uh, there is this wonderful uh, driving habit of just putting the hand on the horn <laughs> and leaving it there, which creates you know, a great deal of street noise. Um, street noise tends to be between 75 and 90 decibels in most cities. And I think Mumbai is at the top end of that spectrum. Incidentally, it's important to understand with decibels that that is a logarithmic scale, which means an increase of 10 decibels is actually a doubling of the noise. So when you say we've just gone from 70 to 80 decibels, that doesn't sound too bad, it's double, double the noise. 
So we need to understand that moving from 80 to 90 is double already a lot of noise into, you know, serious cacophony. And 85 decibels is the level at which in Europe, at least, employers are obligated to give their employees hearing protection. Because if you are in 85 decibels or more for extended periods, it's damaging your hearing irrevocably. There's nothing you can do to bring it back once it's damaged. So noise is an issue. And it's an issue because when you're standing in that kind of noise, you get into the habit of suppressing your awareness of what's going on around you through your ears. It's not nice. It's really unpleasant. You're shouting conversations to people. You know, we become desensitized in that way. Um, we don't get much silence in the world. And uh, unfortunately, this means our ears tend to go a bit numb. The second big influence, I think, is technology. You know, we've invented ways of recording things. Um, now, there's a wonderful tradition in India in classical music, which is that it's not written down at all. You learn by sitting at the feet of your guru and he goes, it goes da 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 and you have to learn it and you learn it and you learn it. If you don't listen, you miss it and you don't learn. So listening is incredibly important in that tradition. But we've got YouTube, we've got books, we've got recordings, and you know, the, the premium on that kind of listening is very rare these days. Most of the time, if you miss it, oh, I'll check it later. I'll look at his book. You know, I can look at this video later. I'll just half watch it now while I'm doing the, something else. So we get into a habit of partial listening, multitasking, doing several things at once. Scott Peck, the uh, great American author, who wrote a wonderful book called The Road Less Traveled, one of my faves. He said, you cannot truly listen to another human being and do anything else at the same time. I think that's absolutely true. And yet how often do we give somebody our whole attention? Actually, I have to say in this time of lockdown and video conferencing, everybody's getting into Zoom and Skype and so forth. The attention level in this kind of communication is more than you would normally get either face to face or on the telephone. Because I can see you. If you start reading a book, I would feel offended. And you can see me. Whereas if we're on the telephone, goodness knows what we're all doing. Well, mm -hmm, uh huh. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we're doing anything else other than really listening. And if we're face to face, that's also true. How often are you talking to somebody? No, I am listening. No, you're sending a text. That's not listening. That's doing something else. So I think this is quite interesting. I think there's been a great deal more listening going on in the world in these kind of conversations uh, because of this video conferencing revolution that we've experienced. So uh, those are a couple. I mean, technology, uh, let me just go back to that. Um, it's it gets us into um, FOMO, into this fear of missing out, into an addictive relationship with the thing where it's always I should be doing something else. We're not very present because somebody might be tweeting about me or somebody might attack me or I better check or I might have an email. Oh, my goodness. My email just pinged. You know, so you get families sitting around tables at mealtime, all of them with devices, not talking to each other at all. That's uh, a phenomenon which Sherry Turkle, who's another great TED talker, um, spoke about in her TED talk on being alone together. And that's a very, very common phenomenon now with devices taking our attention. I mean, I wonder how many people watching this do their email in bed at night and so forth, you know, instead of actually being with our partner, being with our family, putting these things down. Uh, it's, it's a very challenging thing to take a holiday from technology. Sadly, there's nobody in the world who can stop technology or even slow it down. It's an unstoppable force. So we all have to take personal responsibility for our relationship with it and make sure that it doesn't trash our listening completely. And the other little bit of technology I'd mention is headphones. Um, there's a great tendency in open plan offices. If you go into many big open plan offices, when people want to concentrate on come the headphones, which is very understandable. He um, headphones are becoming enormously popular, especially with young people and uh, there is a danger there because if you put, as I said, more than 80 decibels into your ears for a long period of time, 
you really damage your hearing. And the damage is much quicker the higher you go. Now, sadly, a lot of kids are putting 100 decibels into their ears, really loud music with earbuds which go deep into the ears and they are killing their hearing. One in six American teenagers has got damaged hearing now as a result of headphone abuse. So we're raising potentially an entire deaf generation. Your hearing degrades as you get older. I mean, a, a basic rule of thumb with headphones for anybody watching this is that if you can't hear somebody speaking to you in a loud voice from maybe a meter away, three feet away, it's too loud. And uh, another good tip with headphones is to get, if you're going to use headphones, really invest in getting the best ones you can afford. Because if we buy cheap headphones, the temptation is always to turn it up, turn it up, turn it up, to get that bit more bass or that bit more oomph in the sound. Uh, you get numb and you acclimatize to a sound level and then you turn it up to get that little buzz again. And it goes on and on and on, up and up and up until your hearing is getting damaged. So those are a couple of things about headphones. So technology, you have to be really careful about. You know, the we've been speaking and listening for with complex language for at least 100,000 years, 100,000 years. Writing came along only 4,000 years ago in the world. So it's relatively recent. And yet so much of our communication now involves our fingers and our eyes text, instant messaging, social media, email, of course, hundreds of emails coming in all the time. It's this overload. Uh, writing is a wonderful thing. It's been responsible for some of the great transformations in the world, some of the great revolutions of thought, uh, some great movements. You can't publish speaking. You can't go back and check speaking. It's immediate, but it's also hugely rich. And it contains, you know, with the voice, it contains all of these elements that you don't get when you just read something. So I think it's a sacred art, actually, speaking and mostly, of course, listening. And it's one that we are losing. Julian, can you explain the importance of silence? Sure. Well, I think silence is a sound, first of all. It's not just a nothing. It is a sound. And it's also a very important sound because it's the gaps between the words. It's the gaps between the notes. Without silence, everything becomes chaos and unintelligible. With silence, we have some structure. So it is the valleys between the mountains. Um, we need that, otherwise um, there is no differentiation. Sadly, we don't have a lot of it, especially in urban living now, it's very difficult to get silence. There's the thrum of a city around you all the time, which I know many people like, and each city has a different voice. Nevertheless, it's really worth finding, if you can, a space in your home where you can shut doors. Uh, it, might be a, it might be a toilet, it might be a cupboard, <laughs> wherever it is, somewhere where you can shut yourself away and experience just a few minutes of peace and quiet. And if you can't get absolute silence, the nearest you can get to it I would recommend doing that two or three times a day, just for a few minutes, because what it does is it recalibrates your ears. It allows your ears to regain their sensitivity. Silence is your baseline. It's the baseline of all sound. And unless you retreat to that baseline once in a while, you're, you're going through that process of being numbed by the noise around you all the time. If you talk to anybody in the recording industry, a, a, you know, a studio engineer, they have to take breaks every 45 minutes or an hour. They'll go into a quiet space because if you're listening all the time, you become numb and you can't hear the thing anymore. You just go insensitive. So they know this secret. And I really do advise anybody listening to this, try and get two or three little chunks of silence in your day and your hearing, your listening will become transformed and much fresher. Julian, what are some danger words that people use? Yeah, there are a few that I talk about in my in my course and in my book. Um, one of the biggest ones, and this is a word I banned from my vocabulary years ago, is the word should. It's a very judgmental word. It doesn't, I can't think of any useful or positive ways of deploying that word. Uh, you know, you should be doing this. 
it's it's judgmental immediately i should be i should be so much more whatever i'm judging myself it's a kind of immediate statement of failure and it's blaming so uh, i tend to avoid that word uh, in fact i fully avoid that word at all times and there are more positive ways to put things you know you how about you take on this or how about I feel I need to go over there or do this thing. I'm going to set a program in place. You know, there are positive ways to look at these things, not self-blaming. I should, I should, I shouldn't, I should, you should. Other words that you can cut out quite profitably, well, the maximizers, of course. Um, we all know how the maximizers always, never, everybody, nobody, how they always calm down an argument, don't they? No. <laughs> You never, you always, you know, those are guaranteed to uh, up the ante and to make the argument more violent and um, more angry. They're not true. They are probably never true, <laughs> but uh, we do tend to use them as, as soon as we get angry. So that, that's a good one to avoid, the maximizers. The word but uh, is also very easy to replace. So if I say, um, I like you, but does the first part of that sentence land? No, you're not interested in that. You know what's coming after the but is the interesting bit. So but is a kind of roadblock in the middle of a, a sentence. Much more interesting to say, I like you. And well, then we can flow on. You know, you'll accept the first part and the second part may or may not be rather different. And I promise you, you can do this with a spell checker and you can do this when you're speaking you can replace the word but with the word and pretty much universally. There are very few times you actually need to use that word but. So those are some of the danger words. Um, there's one other one I'll mention. It's a small and seemingly harmless word, but it does reduce the power of your speaking a great deal. And it can also be a little bit pernicious. The word just. I don't mean the adjective just. He's a just man. That's a great word. I mean, the adverbal use of it, and especially as a minimizer, as in, I'll just have one. How many times have we just had one and regretted it? Or um, she's just a child. Well, it's demeaning. As soon as you start to minimize people in that way, it's demeaning. And when it creeps into conversation, it is an elided apology. So I do a thing when, I, uh, when I'm on stage, I demonstrate this by coming on stage and say, I'd just like to start with some housekeeping announcements, which sounds perfectly normal. Go off, come back on again and say, I'd like to start with some housekeeping announcements. Now, when you hear the second version, you hear how weak the first one was, because when you're saying, I'd just like to, it's like, do you mind if I please, sorry, you, could I, it's this kind of, apology coming out minimizing do you do you just do you mind if we just do this do you mind if we do this there is a big difference in power so that's another word that's worth avoiding if possible in that way julian now we have a question from a subscriber chase is asking what are the top three mistakes people make while communicating with others well the number one would be not listening doing something else and uh First of all, I think it's uh, it's rude, but secondly, it's doing yourself out of the possibility of connecting and learning. I think we've never needed listening more than we do in the world today. So uh, not listening is the first one. Prioritizing sending would be the second one. Uh, you know, the rise of social media is uh, very much about what I call personal broadcasting. It's this desire to be heard. That's why I called my book How to Be Heard, because we all want to be heard. But actually, the paradox is, in order to be heard, you need to listen. In order to be heard, you need to listen. Because if you're standing there broadcast, you know when we're tweeting, I'm on a train. Who cares, really? I mean, we have this fantasy that there are thousands of people out there hanging on our every tweet or post or blog or whatever it might be. They're not. They don't exist. You know, when you tweet, you, got, you might get one or two people seeing it as it flows past in the Twitter stream. But really, this obsession with broadcasting and being out there and um, being revered, if you like, um, well, that's very much about being 
about it's about looking good um and that is a major error in 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 communication and the third one that i would say which is very common is the need to be right now harville hendrix the american author who created a wonderful program called the imago program uh, he has a great quote on that. He says, uh, you can either be right or be in a relationship. Which is brilliant because and, and he says you can't you can't curl up with being right at the end of the day. Um, being right is so ingrained into so many of us. Uh, it creates so many arguments. And look at what's happening in politics right now. We've got this polarization caricaturing in your country, in America, in my country. It's going on all over the place where people are demonizing other people. People are not listening, they're shouting. They are uh, getting more and more entrenched in their views. You know, there's a, the word we used to use for the internet is surfing or browsing, but we don't really do that. What we do most of the time is go off and find validation of our own viewpoint. Um, there's a quote from Barack Obama, which I like. He said, I like to listen to people, especially when I disagree with them. Well, that's rare. Most of us like to listen to people who validate our position. There you are. I knew I was right. And of course, the easiest way to be right is to make somebody else wrong. Hence, we have this addiction to outrage in the media, uh, which is fueled by the press. The press are doing it all the time, but they're fueled by us. So we're in the kind of unpleasant dance here of making people wrong. Somebody's to blame. Somebody must be punished. This is disgusting. This is outrageous. And the moment we start doing this, we're raising ourselves up and making somebody else wrong. I'm right. They're wrong. And there's a kind of buzz about being right in that way. And it's very unfortunate that that is what's driving politics, not consensus and not wanting to understand other people. I may disagree with you, but I can I can still be interested in why you believe what you believe and I can understand that and I can even validate it you know given your life I can see why you would believe that I don't agree with it but I I understand it there's very little of that going on in the world now politicians go off and have talks I wish they would go off and have listens instead Julian would you like to issue a seven day challenge to our subscribers yes I think a great seven day challenge is wherever you are many of us are in lockdown and will be for some weeks to come so i mean it is now a, a challenging time there's a lot of arguments going on in the world we're in confined environments with our families and that can be quite stressful uh, rather than retreating and escaping my seven day challenge to anybody uh, watching this is to truly listen to people truly listen now that, I have a, a little exercise for that. It's called rasa, and the, uh, which I believe is the Sanskrit word for juice in any event. Um, that's what I've been told. Uh, in this context, it's an acronym. It stands for receive, appreciate, summarize, ask. It's a very good way to listen to people in conversation. So receive means looking at the person. So eye contact to the person who's speaking, not doing something else at the same time, not halfway out of the door, pointing in another direction, actually focusing on the person and doing what you're doing, which is if you can see the person, you know, physically showing that you're with them. So nods, eyebrow raises, smiles, you know, little noises like, mm, oh, OK, which you're not doing because we're on a, a communication that's being recorded and it would be irritating for people listening. But if this is a normal conversation, you'd be going, oh, really? You know, so that's the R. The A is um, appreciate. Um, and that's those little uh, noises I just talked about. So R and A together are exactly what you're doing. Receive is pay attention, appreciate is show that you're paying attention. The S is summarize. Now this is very powerful in conversation. The word so, and it's a great word because in the corridor of a conversation, the word so can close doors behind you and lock down contents. You can move on instead of going around in circles. So. What I heard you say is this. Is that correct? Yes. OK, I got you. You know, you you are received. Now we can move on to the next point or so. What we've all agreed is this. Now can we, we can move on to that. 
so summarize. And the A, the final A is ask, ask questions. Ideally open questions if you want to have a nice conversation. Why, what, where, when, which, who, uh, and so forth, because they don't permit the answer yes or no. And they tend to open a conversation up. Tell me more is another great thing to say in a conversation. That's interesting. Tell me more about that. So it shows that's again showing active listening and it tends to make conversations roll. So my challenge is listen to somebody in your family with Rasa. F try it for seven days. You'll probably, first of all, get the response. What are you doing? Because people are not used to being listened to in that way. But you will find it's amazing the transformation it can make in relationships. Julian, can you once again share where can people connect with you so that they will remember it better? Sure. Uh, the website is juliantreasure.com and there you can sign up and get five listening tips, little exercises in video, absolutely free. And uh, so I welcome people to do that. Um, but I've also got an online course, which is seven and a half hours of material about speaking and listening. And uh, then the, my company is the, the Sound Agency, which is at thesoundagency.com. So any of those ways, delighted to have people come by. Thank you very much, Julian, for spending time and enlightening us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Cheers. Do subscribe to BNS Goku Great.